Is this your first time you've attended what the CEO wants you to know or needs you to know earnings call lab? I'm going to go ahead and open that. Now, in order to use the polling question, you just have to select it and make sure you hit submit. Uh, if you don't hit submit, it's not, it's going to get stuck in, in progress. But uh, looking forward to having people with us today. You know, here at Acumen Learning, we've been in business almost 20 years. Next year, we'll hit our 20 uh, year anniversary. We focus purely on this topic of business and financial acumen. This program you're a part of today is all about helping employees understand how do I listen to these earnings calls? How do I make sense of them and use them in my role, whatever my role might be? So excited to have you with us today. And as we close that poll, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, share the results with you. As I said, uh, we got a chance to work with many great companies uh, in the energy industry, uh, uh, healthcare, consumer products, retail, technology. Uh, you pick an industry, we've probably done stuff in that. So looking forward to looking at Chevron, who uh, the energy in industry has been hit pretty dramatically over the last year. So it looks like uh, as we look at the results, uh, let's see, Majority of you have not attended. So uh, welcome. Good to have you here. And hopefully you'll find this to be helpful as we get going. Well, the second thing we're going to use is the chat box. So make sure you have that open and just grab that if you would. And here's what I want you to put. Make sure, by the way, as you open that chat box, it should be an icon at the bottom of your screen. It should say send to. Make sure that the send to is set to everyone. Now, here's what I want you to do. In the chat box, tell me where you're calling in from or where you're listening from. It could be a city, could be a state, could be a country, or it may even be a location in your home as some of us are, are working from our home today. Uh, Ginger and I are calling in from Salt Lake City, Utah. Our claim to fame, greatest snow on earth. Now, Colorado might argue, some of the places in uh, Europe might argue differently, but man, uh, we had a great opportunity in 2002 to host the Winter Olympics. So uh, that's kind of our claim to fame. Well, folks, it looks like that chat box is working just fine. So this is where you're going to ask questions, interact, et cetera. With the number of people on the call, we can't really unmute, um, but uh, feel free. Now, as you think about taking notes and that types of thing, at the end of this program, it's getting recorded. The fact that you've registered, you'll get access to it. So you have a recording, you can look at it, as well as it'll make it all of our recordings available to you. Uh, in addition to that, the tool that we're going to walk through, you're going to get that at the end. So that will be available as we get going. Uh, a little bit later. So I uh, sit back and let's let's jump in and uh, we're going to walk through how to listen to an earnings call. So with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen. You should see uh, uh, the slide say, welcome to our earnings call. So I've got another poll question as we get going today. And the poll question is this, you come into a program where we're going to talk about how to listen to an earnings call. And my question is, when is the last time you listened to an earnings call? Got that as a poll question right there. Was it this year? Was it last year? You know what, Brent? <laughs> it's been a while since I've listened to these earnings calls. Uh, I never listened to an earnings call, or <laughs> I'd rather go to the dentist. I, you know, some of these, uh, Walmarts, I think, uh, combined their earnings call with their annual meeting. It was like a three-hour call. My colleague had a chance to look at them last year. It was, I'm glad he had that one, not me. That was a long one. But uh, uh, these earnings calls happen on a quarterly basis. As a publicly traded company, they're not required to do them, but most companies are going to take that opportunity to do that, to share to the market. They don't want to just share information out there. They want to give their pitch. They want to share their strategy and help give clarification so the market can kind of see their strategy, what they're trying to do, where they're currently at, where they want to go, and, and, and how they're going to get there is really what these earnings calls uh, provide. Now, they uh, last about an hour is typically the time. Some are a little shorter, some are a little longer, but about an hour. And they're going to cover some great information, both on the quarterly experience, what happened, but also year to date, as well as what they're expecting uh, to happen in the, in the future here. Sorry, my cursor is getting out of control here, but let me share the uh, re replies there. It looks like listening to, uh, man, many of you have listened to them. Great. It's just a few of you have never listened to them, and I appreciate that. I'd rather listen to, I'd uh, rather go to the dentist comment there. Well, let's jump into this a little bit as we think about these earnings calls. As we describe this, interesting enough, these calls happen on a regular basis. But this statistics is kind of interesting. Even with these calls, 95% of employees don't understand company strategy. Now, you might be saying, well, how does that fit within my company? Do I think it's less? We've got much more clarity around our company strategy at my company. Uh, or is it even, I, I question if even 5% understand. Here's another stat that kind of makes it interesting as you think about earnings calls. 90% of uh, employees don't understand their company's key business metrics. 
Well, folks, I call these a hidden gem. There, there's something that's available that often we don't take the time to kind of really get in. This is a tool. These earnings calls and the tool that I'm going to provide you are really going to help you set yourself apart in the organization. As you think about that, imagine you're the CEO of Chevron. Michael or Mike Worth, uh, chairman of the board and chief executive officer. Been with the company for a number of years. You got just under 48,000 employees globally dispersed. You've just gone through a global pandemic where oil prices, remember the oil futures, you may remember this from last year, oil futures actually went in negative territory. <laughs> First time it had ever happened. Uh, price drops to an all-time low. And now shift a year later, oil prices over $80 a barrel. Folks, that's better than it's been in a long time. Uh, so this swing from a huge drop to now a huge success, going through a pandemic, pulling back all of your operations and trying to get them restart. What is it you want your employees to understand? <laughs> And where do you get that, give that information? They're, they're, these calls to help the employees know what he wants them to understand. Uh, what is it you, you need your customers to know about your business? What about your shareholders? What is it that you want them to know? As well as partners that you might, joint ventures, et cetera, as, as one of their big projects right now at Chevron is a joint venture. What is it you're trying to communicate? That's what these earning calls are all about. It gives them a chance to communicate to employees, to customers, to competitors, uh, to partners, to shareholders. Here's where we're at. Here's where we're trying to go. And here's what we're trying to do to get there. Now, here is my guarantee to you. Uh, we do about a thousand of these a year, uh, 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 sessions with different clients, different industries. My guarantee, uh, this is absolutely clearly found in our data is this. As people take this tool and use it for the next two to three quarters, my experience with my clients is this. It truly will build your credibility, it'll build your career, and it'll help you to build your company. What we find is senior executives are doing everything they can to squeeze a dollar of the financial statements. But in the chat box, tell me who really impacts the business? Is it Mike and his team? Who's really impacting the day in and day out decisions of this company? This would be the participatory part of our experience. <laughs> Is it the senior executives? Yeah, it's everyone, it's the employees. You got 48,000 employees every day making decisions that are either gonna be additive to your strategy or can be neutral, or maybe even, heaven forbid, detracting from your strategy. What we fly in is employees are functionally brilliant. Working with many great companies, many industries, we find the employees know their roles better than I would ever know their roles. That being said, we often kind of work our careers through our blinders. You know, I'm, I'm a, a trainer, so I'm very focused on learning and development and how to build learning paths, et cetera. Well, what these earnings calls are all about and using this tool is about stepping back. And again, my guarantee is as you step back and you use the tool, and I, I'll give you two to three is what I find. If you do two to three consecutive, you're going to know more about your business than most of your colleagues, peers, direct reports, maybe even some of your senior leaders in the organization. As you then take that information and act, do something with it, apply, you're going to make a difference. It truly will build your credibility. People will start saying, how do you know so much about our business? Uh, it's going to create opportunities in a career and you'll have a positive impact on the business. That is our goal here. That is the purpose of what we're here to, to do today. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into our program today. I want to give you a simple framework and I'm going to give you two tools that will help you to assess your company's uh, program. Now you might be saying, Brent, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not working for a publicly traded company. Well, the principles here are very applicable in your own company. How can I gather data about our strategy, what we're working on, and then be able to take that information and make decisions in my day-to-day -day activity. It may be that you're selling into a customer. Use this information to understand the customer, to be that trusted partner, et cetera. This is a great resource to help you build your credibility, your career, and your company. So with that in mind, three steps. The three-step process we're going to suggest is to prepare, analyze, and apply. And the tool that I'm going to give you access to a little bit later today actually walks you through each of those three steps. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and jump into the prepare phase. As we jump into the prepare phase, uh, I want to start with just a quick earnings call one-on-one. For those, that small percent, I think there's 8% of you that may not have ever uh, listened to one of these earnings calls. Uh, they're about an hour long, as I said before, and they're typically broken up into two parts. Part one is what we call the prepared remarks. This is where the executives are gonna communicate kind of where they're currently at, 
well, how they performed, where they're currently at, and where they want to go as a business. They're going to talk about what caused the growth that they have, as well as what caused maybe the curtailment or reduction in metrics or measures. They're then going to describe, here's what we're going to do in the coming quarters, and here's kind of our annual forecast or expectations. Those last anywhere from about 15 minutes to about 25, 30 minutes. This one, Chevron's, this is Q2 earnings call. By the way, their Q1, or excuse me, Q3 call happens on Friday. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, they, they, this most recent one, it was about 15 minutes of them talking. Then the majority of their call, it was about an hour, was the Q&A. This is where analysts have an opportunity to ask questions, get clarification. Now, some will say, as you think of these earnings call, if you're working in your internal company, they might say, hey, just listen to the prepared remarks to get your strategy. Now, if you're limited on time, that's fine. You can do that. But here's my recommendation to you. I would highly recommend trying to go through those Q&A questions. Now, don't get caught up in the detail. Look for themes. What are they talking about? Where are they pushing or questioning it? For example, one of the questions they had for Chevron is Chevron's going back to a big stock buyback, two to $3 billion buying back of shares. And the market's kind of pushing. Three or four of them said, Hey, are, now tell me, what's your expectation on commodity pricing around that? Hey, where is that money? Are you really going to pay? They're kind of saying, look, I see you're doing well. But the moment you start talking about buyback, the market expects it. So they're trying to question, is this a short-term thing or is it a long-term thing? That's a great theme to think about and say, okay, well, how, how does that impact the decision-making of our business, et cetera? But in the end, that's what they look like. With that in mind, let me just walk through the prepare phase. Three things I recommend you do. Number one, you gotta locate the caller transcript. Now this is pretty easy to do. I'm gonna just swap screens. You should be able to see a Google screen. Uh, and this great website, you may not have heard of it, it's called Google. <laughs> uh, that's getting old. That's a joke I've used many times, but hey, hopefully it's okay. Maybe it's a dad joke. But all you're gonna do is you're gonna do, um, who are you looking for? I wanna look at Chevron. And what do I want? Well, I know that they don't have Q3 out, so I'm gonna look at Q2, oops. Q2, and I'm going to do earnings call. Now, you notice it's already jumping to all sorts of stuff. I can pick any one of those and get access to it. I'll just pick this one right here. I jump on that. Now, you'll notice a bunch of different stuff I can look at. Uh, you're going to see stuff specifically from the company, but you're also going to see Yahoo. You're going to see what's called Motley Food, CNBC, all these different third parties trying to uh, give uh, information. My recommendation is start with the company itself. So look for something that says Chevron. That's what I want to look for. So I go right here, Q2, earnings call, conference call. Oh, this looks like probably what it is. Let me see. Oops, let me hit on it. Oh, look, I'm there. There it is. Here's their Q2 information. Now, because this call has already happened, it's going to be all the data post the call. So I have their earnings release. This is what came out the day or two or the day of that earnings call. A little description. Now, the earnings call... Uh, releases are great. They'll have the basic financials unaudited, but you don't want to have to wait for when their audited numbers come out. They'll give you those numbers in that press release. Uh, the other things it does is a press release often will give just a great summation of the call itself. So if you don't have time to go through the whole call, which by the way, I recommend setting an hour aside every quarter to do this, but if you don't, that earnings call is a great place to use these tools as well. What are they talking about? Uh, where are they focus on, et cetera. Uh, they got some supplemental earnings information, the conference call presentation. I love it. If a company has a presentation, you're going to get great summarized data on what's happening in their business. And then finally, the transcript. What I like about the transcript is it gives me a quick way. If I don't want to just listen to it, I can actually read it and get through the information. Who was on the call? Here's their CFO talking about their business. Here's what happened in the numbers. It's all right here in front of us. That was, what, 30 seconds to access that data. Now, if it's pre-call, you're not going to have that information. So let me come over here. I'll just go to their events page. That's where you find this. I skipped it by doing the search. It took me right to Q2. But here's their events page, and here's that data. The data I was just on is right here. Friday, July, that was their Q2. But notice right here. They've already got their Q3 information. I click on that. Now, notice I don't have a transcript. I don't have any of those things. Why? It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen this Friday. So if I want to get it, if, if you work for Chevron and you come into our session, my challenge to you is get registered today. Get on. It'll send you an invite it'll, right here. I click on it. You jump in. gives you some data, information. You can add it to your calendar, but it'll send you a little invite and you're ready to go. So if it's pre-call, you just register for it. If it's post-call, you go to the, the, the recording. Actually, you can get access to the recording, the Q2, if you want to listen to it, or the transcript, et cetera. Folks, that how you, that's how you do it. A simple Google search 
What am I looking for? And you get access to that information. Well, once you've located the call or you got access after the call to the transcript, et cetera, what, what do you do in preparation? Well, review your notes. Review, review your notes from the past call. Now, if for some of you who have never been on a call, you could go to their Q2, just as what I did, and capture all the Q2 information, do a little review of that in preparation. But the real goal is as you use this tool on a consistent basis, all you're going to do is grab that tool. So, for example, I'm going to share with you the Q2 information. Let's say you go to this this Friday and you want to listen to the Q3 information. Well, just do a quick review of the document that I put together, and then you're ready to jump in on that call. As you capture that information quarter over quarter, honestly, about two calls to three calls into it, you'll know exactly what they're executing. The executives end up saying the same thing. The numbers change. The strategy may change, but the process is very consistent. Once you get the process down, you can scan these and get through them in about 30 minutes and be very comfortable with what's going on in your business. So that's review your notes. The last thing is meet with your team. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, these are great resources to do on your own, and the tool is meant you can do it all by yourself if you need to. But the value of doing it with a team, if you're a manager, highly recommend bring your team together. Walk through this exercise. I'm only asking one hour a quarter. Now, if you want to do an abbreviated, maybe you come prepared with just some segments you're going to share with them and have a discussion that apply to your team. But if you do it with somebody, you're going to get more value out of it. You can do it with your team. You can do it with a colleague. You can do it with a friend. What you find is as you do it together and you do your review of it, you're going to get much more value out of that experience. So our recommendation is to do it with somebody else. Meet with your team. Do it with a colleague, et cetera. Folks, that is the preparation phase. Well, let's jump into analyze. That's the meat of what I'm going to describe today, and then we'll get into our apply phase. So the meat of this is how do I analyze? How do I take that information and capture it? There's going to be a lot of data, a lot of metrics being thrown around, a lot of strategy. How do I kind of conceptualize it into something I can use as I go to apply it? Well, I'm going to give you a framework and two tools that will help you to do that. Here's the framework. Now, a number of you have been through our program, so you're going to help me. I'm going to do a quick review for those that haven't been in our programs, a quick review of this model. It's called the five driver business model. As you look at the five driver business model, what we'd suggest in our 20 years of experience working with some of the greatest companies in the world is that these five fundamental drivers are applicable, whether you're a multi-billion dollar Chevron oil and gas company or your small mom and pop shop. These are the fundamental drivers every company focuses on. Now, the value of this framework is it helps you to, as you're listening to this call, how do I conceptualize what they're talking about? Well, it's very easy. Are they talking about cash? Are they talking about profit? Are they talking assets, growth, or people? And then there's some tools that will help you to kind of capture that. So as a quick review of this, help me in my chat box. We talk about cash as a key fundamental driver. In fact, this is one of the drivers that is very, very important. Yet often you don't hear companies talk a lot about it unless they're running out of it. For those of you who were with us earlier this year, we did a Boeing. Boeing had to borrow $42 billion in 2020 because of the downturn versus an Amazon it was a cash cow. They were creating cash as much. So you didn't hear a lot about cash for Amazon, but Boeing, you heard a lot about it. Well, as a review, real quickly, when we talk about cash in business, fill in the blank for me. Cash is blank. Put it in the, the bl uh, blank in my chat box, would you? Cash is king, absolute king, essential, vital, queen, however you want to look at Cash is vitally important. In fact, one a consultant talks about cash as being a company's oxygen supply. How true is that during uh, the COVID pandemic? Those companies that had cash were able to stand the ups and downs. Those that didn't struggled to stay alive. Cash is vitally important. Now, when we talk cash in, the, in our core program, we talk about two key metrics. One is called cash and cash equivalent. The other is called uh, cash flow. Now, cash and cash equivalent, when you think of this, think of it as kind of a, a savings account. It's cash they carry on their balance sheet. Uh, we'll show you in a moment. Chevron has about $7.5, $7.6 billion of cash on their balance sheet. Now, as an investor, do I want that cash to keep going up, the cash they're holding in their savings account? Probably not. What would I prefer they do with that cash? I want to take that. I want to get, get it invested or give it back to me as an investor, right? So you'll see this number, that cash and cash equivalent kind of goes up and down based upon strategy. Versus the other metric we talk about, which is cash flow, which represents the cash a company generates from its core business. This is vitally important. What do you think investors want that to do? We'll put it in the chat box. If you're an investor in Chevron, what do you want the cash they generate quarter over quarter, year over year to do? Go up, remain flat, or go down? 
quarter. I has absolutely we want that to go up every month, every quarter. Why, why do I want it to go up? The more cash they generate, the more they potentially are going to get back to me in dividends, stock buybacks, etc. So this is a key metric the market looks at. Now, the foundation of this first statement is that um, uh, the foundation of that first driver is the cash flow statement. So if you want to know what happened in cash in a business, you jump to that cash flow statement. You see how much they generate, where they deploy in it, how much do they get back to investors, et cetera. Well, the next key metric or uh, driver we talk about is that of profitability. Now, in profitability in our courses, we talk about two levers you have to impact profitability. One is you're going to increase a lever. The other is decrease a lever or a combination of both. For those of you who have taken our program, what are the two levers? If you want to grow profitability in a business, what are the two levers you have? Do you remember? What do you have to increase and or decrease to increase profitability in a company? Put in the chat box. Okay, lower costs. Absolutely. So reduce my expenses, lower my costs, or grow your sales revenue. Now, just by way of reminders, I'll put in the chat box uh, for those that are there. Revenue. Sales and top line are the same thing in business. The other ones you'll look at is profit, earnings, and income. I can't talk, I type and talk very well, so if I misspell my apologies, are exactly the same thing as well. So we could talk about net profit, net earnings, or net income. It's all the same thing. But those levers, anything you do to increase revenue, top lines, sales, whatever you want to call it, while managing your expenses or even reducing your expenses, you'll increase the profitability of the business. Now, there's all sorts of profit metrics you can look at. Gross profit, operating profit, net profit, EBIT, EBIT dot, extra credit points in the chat box. What does EBIT or EBIT dot stand for? I'll give you extra credit on either one of those. Key metrics you'll hear executives talk about. EBIT, EBIT dot, or EBIT dot is up to 20%. Our margin on EBIT dot is this percent, et cetera. Uh, we got part of it, earnings before, interest and tax, that's our EBIT, earnings before, interest tax, which by the way, you can actually call it profit before interest and tax. Remember I said earnings, income, and profit are the same thing. So earnings before interest and tax, uh, or earning, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, key metrics companies look at. Of course, what do we want our profitability to do? We want to see that go up. Now, assets. Assets, uh, as we talk assets in a business, it's anything we own or control which has value. As you think of a Chevron, in the chat box, what does Chevron own or control which has value? Put in the chat box. What are their assets? If I want to look at that, I'm going to jump to that balance sheet and see what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, fuel, uh, oil, uh, drilling rights, or what they call land leases, absolutely. They got wells. All, all the equipment, you think about rig equipment, you got refineries. And now people, Jacqueline, I love that. Now let's go back to that definition. Anything we own or control which has value. Do we own or control our people? Now I may feel that way sometimes as you're working late night, one night, trying to keep up with stuff, et cetera. But there is a way to think about people because we often hear executives say our people are our greatest assets. If you look at from a financial perspective or an accounting perspective, you're not going to go to the balance sheet and they're going to say, here's the value of my people. But there's different ways to look at the value. Obviously, people, you'll notice where we've got it. It's the core of our model. That's the center of it. So we'll talk about it. But definitely buildings, equipment, et cetera, assets. You're balancing two things, what we call asset strength. And my name strong financial position, meaning how much cash do I have? How much what we call leveraging, meaning how much borrowings do I have? Now, a, a simple way to think about think about if you bought a home. If I, a first-time buyer of a home, and I only have 3% ownership in my home, am I in a strong financial position? <laughs> Not very much. Versus I own 50% of my home. Am I in a strong financial position? Absolutely. So they look at asset strength. How financially strong is a company? But in addition to that, the, the other side of that coin is, how am I deploying my assets to generate greater pro pro profitability and greater cash flow? So there's this balance. If you look at Chevron, they're in a very strong financial position. They're paying down debt. Their, their, their leverage position is very low. We'll show that in just a moment. So they're very strong, which then allows them to get the best interest rates that they need to borrow. They can take that strength and invest it and expand, uh, play a bigger role in new energies or whatever they might want to do. But that's what we're looking at from an asset. What do they have and how do they deploy what they have? Asset strength versus asset utilization. Now, of course, growth is what investors expect. And you'll hear this all the time. Even when a company's struggling, you'll see, hey, we, 
uh, you know, last year when oil price dropped as dramatically as it did. Well, yeah, we're down 50%. We had to take an impairment. We did this, this. But now let me tell you, here's what we're doing. And we expect to pull out of this. We're going to grow. We're going to expand as we move forward. So even when they're struggling, you'll hear them talk a lot about growth. But what do we want to grow? Well, we want to grow our asset base, to get great assets that we can deploy, that get high return with low carbon input in, uh, impact is, is Chevron's model. Of course, I want to grow my profitability. I want to grow my cash, et cetera. Now, the core of our model is people. We purposely have that in the center to suggest that's what drives an organization. You can have great cash position, great profitability metrics or measure, margins, uh, great assets you can deploy and growth opportunity. But if you can't get this right, meaning you don't understand the customers you're selling to, you can't anticipate their needs. Or internally, you can't get your team to execute. You will not succeed in business. So, folks, that's the five-driver model. Very simply put, if you want more information, at the end of this, you're going to have a place you can reach out to us. We can, if you want to do this with your team, get a deeper dive on your company, happy to do that. We also have an online tool you can use as well. But this framework, you don't have to go through our program to be able to do that. So let me just jump into the first tool. It's using the five driver resource as a way to assess the strategic focus of um, of a company. Love that, Karen. You know, you can't do nothing. You can't do anything without uh, people. Absolutely. Well, let me explain how this tool works. Basically, on these calls, you, you, if you're listening to them or reading, I like to read them. I find a little bit I get more out of it if I read them. But either way, as you're listening or reviewing the transcript, all you're going to do is listen. What are they talking about? Are they talking about cash, profit, asset, growth, and people? And every time they say something about cash, I can put a little slash mark. Every time they say something about profit, I can put a little slash mark. Assets, growth, and people. Eventually, you're going to end up with a lot of different slash marks, right? All over your, your document. Well, at the end, you're going to add those up and you're going to answer four questions. Now, you, for some of you who've never been through a program or a business and financial acumen, earnings calls are a little newer, you might be saying, Brent, boy, I, that's great, but I don't even know if I know what to look for. Well, don't worry. We've thought of that. Here's a quick definition if you want to know what we mean by cash. And I love the second part. Examples, I call them trigger world, words. If I hear them talk about dividends, distribution, stock buybacks, I immediately go to cash. That's a use of cash. Uh, if they're issuing stock, that's a source of They're borrowing us. Anyways, we've got little trigger words to help you to capture what you're looking for. So you don't have to have gone through our program to get some value out of this. At the end of that, all you're going to do is answer four simple questions. And here's the questions. Which driver seems to get the most attention? And I love the second part, why? Think of context. Think of what's going on. Of course, COVID and the big fluctuation of numbers. Why are they talking about this? Uh, what were the two or three main points the executive was trying to make? What are the goals or trends or objectives moving forward? And the last part I love, because it's an earnings call, what were the key questions or concerns raised by analysts? Now, again, if you're running out of time, you may just stick with the re prepared remarks. But if you can afford to do it, this is where you really start to see, is the market believing us or not? Uh, what are their questions? What are their challenges? And can we overcome those? The, that I, I love that part of it. Folks, that is the tool. Now, in an ideal world, in one of our programs called Applying Business Acumen, we actually go through and do this. It's a multiple, uh, uh, it's a couple hour kind of a review of that. We don't have that time. I've got about 30 minutes. So here's what I want to do. We're going to practice it, and then I'm gonna, I filled out the doc. I'll share, share what I found. So here's what I want to do. I, I just want to jump to a quote. So here's their CFO. On this call, they have their CFO, uh, Pierre uh, Breber, Breber. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. They call him Pierre. So um, he's their CFO. It was their CFO and then their executive vice president over what's called upstream. For those that are new to the oil and gas, upstream is the getting access. It's the drilling. It's the, it's the finding, the drilling, and getting the oil out of the ground. Then your midstream is taking that. You're going to process it and get it to a refinery that's going to refine it. And that's where you get your gasoline, your distillates. You, uh, you get uh, plastics and all the different things that come from oil. But we have that upstream player. So this is the person that's dealing with all that, getting access to the oil, getting it out of the ground group. So that's the group. Their CFO, their CEO was not on this call. So here we go. We got CFO. What I want you to do is you've got the five drivers on the right-hand side, side of my slide. In the chat box, as I review this, I want you to put which of the five drivers you see. Okay? So here we go. We delivered strong financial results in the second quarter with the highest reported earnings in over a year. Adjusted earnings were $3.3 billion or $1.71 per share. Okay, look at my five drivers and which of the five drivers seems to stand out in that first quote, just the first quote there. Put in the chat box if you would. What, are they, what is he talking about? 
Okay, definitely profitability. Remember, we said income, earnings, and profit, the same thing. I got in earnings right here. Now, I'm specifically talking about my adjusted earnings, which is going to be a key profitability metric for it. So absolutely, profitability is going to be there. Now, as we said, as we increase revenue, reduce costs, for those that have taken our class, we know that that has a positive impact on cash. So you could even make some connections there, but this, all this stuff for sure is set, talking profitability, 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 which eventually should impact that. Now, I love the growth as well. Highest reported, that suggests growth as well. Excellent, well, let's jump to the next one. So adjusted return on capital was 8%, and we lowered our net debt ratio to 21%. Now, some of you, your eyeballs are rolling back right now. You say, Brent, what the flip is this? Return on capital, here's what it is. All the capital, all the cash invested through debt, cash you kept in your company, or issuing stock, what return did I get? For every $100 I had of that cash, I generated $8 of profitability. This next one, net debt ratio, this speaks to their leveraging. 21% of their capital is in debt, which means the majority of their capital is outside of debt, either cash they kept in, issuing stock, et cetera. That's a strong metric, their low leverage number, which means they have a strong financial position. So which of the five drivers do you hear talked about? Think of financial strength, think of uh, utilization. What, what kind of comes in as you think about that? For sure, it's gonna be assets, it's gonna be part of it. Now return, return does speak to profitability here. The calculation is gonna be uh, some form of profitability divided by your capital employed. So, so definitely uh, profit's probably going to be part of it as well, but definitely your assets. And then uh, to the cash perspective, debt ratio, you know, as I reduce my debt, I'm paying cash out, et cetera. Well, folks, that's kind of how you do it. Let me do one more uh, in this quote, and, and then I'm going to give you a couple others to look at. Here we go. Strong operating cash flow. <laughs> Boy, when it says a word that connects with one of us, it's a pretty easy one to pull that one. Enable us to meet Chevron's top financial priorities. Our dividends, think of that uh, trigger word, dividend was up 4%. We continue to execute our efficient capital program. That's just anything you hear capital, it's cash, how they're deploying their cash. And we paid down $2.5 billion in debt. Which of the five drivers do you hear talked about in this last paragraph? Yeah, absolutely cash. I'm, I'm paying it down debt. That's going to take cash to do that. If you don't give them an IOU, you actually have to pay it. Capital program, that's investing. Now, part of that's going to also impact assets, right? I'm spending cash to build out my assets. Dividends. You can even have people here. Who benefits from dividends? Shareholders. So the fact that their dividends are increasing, that means more cash is going back to their investors. So a positive for people as well. In the end, that's how you do it, folks. Now, one of the things I want to be clear this is not an exact science. As I said, we'll do about a, 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 a thousand sessions a year, approximately a thousand sessions, multiple companies, multiple industries. This is what we've learned. As you do that, if you and I were sitting next to each other and we did this, th these three paragraphs and we did it, we won't get the exact same slash, you, exact same numbers of cash, exact same numbers of profit, et cetera. But what we find over a thousand sessions a, a year is that invariably the top two or three raised to the top with everybody. The whole group will get the top two usually are pretty consistent, top three for sure, where everybody's on the same page with that. So the point is not to say it's exact science, but it starts to give me a theme. I've just listened, okay, I'm seeing a lot about cash, seeing a lot about assets, seeing a lot about profitability. Let me go through the rest and see what it looks like. Well, folks, I got another one. Here's from their, their uh, executive vice president of Upstream. I'm not gonna read it, you just pull the chat box, you review it, what stands out? What five driver stands out to you? So the question around shareholders as, as we're doing this activity, yes, shareholders are absolutely part of the people uh, driver. That's one of the key uh, uh, conting uh, contingencies or groups that uh, executives are focused on, shareholders for sure. So what are you seeing in this? So we're seeing growth, anything else? Review it on your own, what stands out? So uh, cash, profitability you're seeing in there. So you start getting names of areas, what would that be? they talking about there of course production levels we're seeing here uh we're getting uh you know working capital may not be as familiar but but a, a dollar amount there you know pricing uh yeah so pr cash profit assets for sure when you start hearing permian basin that's one of the large oil uh, plays here in north america 
they have a big play there. So that, that's where a lot of their assets are in the Permian Basin. So a big opportunity for them. Lowering costs, managing their costs, which impacts profitability, impacts eventually a collection of cash, et cetera. Well, not only can you do that for the prepared remarks, but you can also do that for um, analyst questions. So here's an analyst question from Paul Senke, lead analyst at Senke Research. Uh, very well known as a, a major player as an analyst within the oil and gas industry. He looks at most oil and gas companies. What stands out as you hear his message and his question? This speaks to a major asset development that they're doing right here. Of course, you've got your P Permian Basin here. What stands out as you review that? What drivers? Yeah, we start talking CapEx and deployment in their big uh, opportunity they have in, I think it's Kazakhstan, if I remember right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Assets and cash are definitely going to be a, a big part of that. Um, you know, you could weave in a little bit around growth there. As what, what do I see happening? Uh, what, the big question is these mega projects. What's going to happen with those? This is a $45 billion project joint venture where Chevron owns 50%. ExxonMobil, I think, was 25 and then a few other players get the last 25%. A big play for Chevron for sure. And uh, you know, what are you seeing? Is that these are what they call long terms? It's multi-year investments, and you're paying off for future benefits. Well, one of the questions you're starting to get with some of these analysts is as you think about all the ESG efforts, the the, the environmental concerns, carbon footprint, and all this. Well, what does that look like in the future? Do you see a real change to where I mean, you have companies saying they're going to be neutral by 2050? A large uh, Total Energies, if you're familiar with them, uh, have, have made a commitment by 2050, they'll be uh, carbon neutral or, or carbon zero carbon uh, footprint, which is interesting. So obviously growth assets definitely play a role. Well, folks, like I said, if we had more time, I'd give you, turn you loose, let you go into it. We don't have that. So what I've done is I've done it for you. Here you go. Here's what I've done. I read through the whole call. Like I said, it was only about 15 minutes from their executive team, which is not as common, to be honest. Uh, uh, may even been closer to like 13 minutes. It's pretty quick. Um, but the majority of it was around their analyst questions, which was interesting. So here's what I found. Uh, now, one of the things I do is I kind of break it up by prepared remarks and, and analysts. Now, you don't have to do it this way. The reason I do that, I see if there's consistency. It's very simple. It's not scientific, but I can see. You'll notice here a little bit, you know, 12 on cash, 32 from the analysts. Uh, that's a big differentiator. Now, of course, the analysts had a lot longer period to discuss things, but that that says to me, okay, well, what, what is the analyst concerned at? And a lot of that dealt with their um, stock buyback, the two two to three billion dollar stock buyback firm. Is that a long term play, or right now where oil price is pretty good, you can do it, but in the future, so it's really kind of getting what's that long term play, and that's where those questions. Uh, so that's why I look at that. Now, of course, the big play there was assets. So I've done the calculation. I've got my knowledge. I kind of condensed it. Here's my big play. You got assets is a big play. Next is going to be cash. Then we're looking at growth. Well, so then I jump into the questions. Here's the four questions that that they had. So let's go through the first question: which business driver seems to get the most attention and why? So for me, it was assets. Why? Why was assets? Well, if you know anything about these fully integrated, they're always building out their assets. They're expanding, they're contracting, they're, they're uh, diversifying, they're, they're going all over the place. So you're always going to get a lot of that. But you're coming out of COVID, and everybody's trying to say, oil market got hit dramatically in 2020. What are you seeing for the future? What can we expect as we go into future quarters? So a lot of discussion around the Permian Basin. Uh, performance continued efficient, improves free cash flow, adding rigs, completion crews. So they're growing more barrels of oil per day. It's really speaking to where we're coming out of the trough, uh, that downturn. And absolutely, everything sh shows from Chevron that they're doing that. This whole thing about lower carbon intensity, that's a big emphasis showing that, hey, here's what we're doing to reduce our carbon fo footprint. They're using natural gas you know, assets, rig uh, uh, equipment that uses natural gas or electricity to lower the cost of, uh, of their operation around uh, the carbon footprint. Of course, this major project, and I'm probably going to totally destroy the name. They didn't actually say it out loud. They just called it TCO. I kind of know why they might be calling it TCO. It's hard to say, but I, I'm saying Tengiz Chev Royal. I don't know if that's right. If you got a better pronunciation, let me know. Uh, but that's their big project, $45 billion. So they're spending $45 billion to build this asset out in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan, and it's a big partnership with Exxon. 
over 84 percent uh, overall 84 percent of their progress um their construction with field construction so it's, it's getting to completion is what they're talking about now that slowed down because of COVID. it slowed down and they actually have an incremental expense about a 1.9 billion dollar of what they call kind of they, they've targeted some dollars to help with the fluctuation of time in the end it wasn't a huge decrease it impacted them one part of their that that project about uh, one quarter another part of the project it, it got slowed down by about two quarters so they're trying to make up but that was a big emphasis. Of course, they're deep water assets and what they're looking at. Well, and Baylor, new opportunities that they're going. They did an acquisition with Nobel, uh, a, a big midstream company. They, they brought that into house, acquired that. And they've seen huge benefits of that. So why are they focused on that? Well, it's, it's a big play. You're coming out of a downturn and you're trying to set the stage like, hey, we got these assets, this and this and this, and this is where they're at. And we're ready at $80, $65 a barrel at the time. We're going to see huge growth. Now, guys, what's barrel? Anybody happen to know what? Uh, barrel of oil today is approximately. I, I'm sure I got some oil and gas people on here. How much per barrel? Of, average for Q2 was $65 a barrel. Anybody happen to know what it is today? If you watch the news, you bought a saw, saw that. I'll give you 30 seconds. This is another extra credit point. I don't know how I'm going to use those extra credit points, but uh, a little bit lower than that. There you go. It's 80 plus dollars. About $85 for Brent. Uh, uh, no, $83 for Brent. $85 for WTI, if I remember correctly. Guys, we're talking at $20. And if you're in oil and gas, if you're a commodity price, that's that's automatic value to you. If pricing changes from $65 a barrel to $85, do you think your cost is going to grow that quickly? Now, some of our service providers say, yeah, I'd love it to grow that quickly, but it won't necessarily grow that quickly. So they're going to get a tremendous amount of profitability, more cash flow available to them. So that's a huge positive for them. Well, one of the things I love about these earnings calls is they do the uh, slide decks. If I find a company that slide deck, there's a lot of data. Here's an update on their various uh, key plays in Gulf of Mexico, Australia, and over here, Colorado initiatives. Talking about Nobel uh, integration, you know, $600 million cost synergy to reduce cost by $600 million by bringing them. That's a huge benefit for that asset they deployed. So some other big projects they're looking at, share repurchasing. So it gives you a lot of information about what they're trying to do and what they're focused on. So I love to kind of weave those in. So assets definitely was a big play. Why? You're coming out of a, a, a pandemic. You want to speak to all the deployment and how you're going to benefit from better commodity pricing. Well, what's the next question? What are the key messages? This message by far, if you go to their website, you'll see it everywhere. Higher returns and lower carbon. This is their mantra. It's something they've been talking about for a couple of years, but definitely a big focus of, of 2021 and beyond. Higher returns and lower carbon. So what assets are giving them higher returns at a lower carbon footprint? And really defining themselves around producing uh, great returns at a lower carbon footprint. Dealer living, uh, another key message, strong results. We hit a lot of those. I won't spend a ton of time on that, but we, higher reported earnings, key turn earnings estimate, ex easily exceeded it. Nearly triple, tripling revenue from prior year periods. Of course, you'd expect that. Uh, this was a huge message, the stock buyback program. What does that say to the market? Think about it. You, you haven't been doing buyback. All of a sudden, you're getting better. You got all these assets deployed, and now you can reinstate a buyback, two to three billion dollars a year for buyback shares. That says there's some confidence that Chevron's going to be doing well. You don't start doing a buyback unless you're pretty confident you can do that. And then, of course, creation uh, of Chevron New Energies was a big part of their message in Q2. So, what would be exciting is it's this next uh, in a couple of days, listening to it, see how much emphasis, what's happened on each one of these initiatives. I imagine they're going to have a lot of uh, opportunities with oil pricing improving. I, I would probably guess, I'm just looking at it an average for the last three months, you're going to be somewhere in the 70s. I mean, you got higher numbers this last little bit, but 75-ish maybe be an average for the month. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's at least 10 to $20 more than where it was in Q2. And I don't know that they were anticipating that dollar improvement. So what are the goals and objectives moving forward? I'm going to hit just a couple quick ones for those that have that interest in a little bit more deep dive. In Q3, they've got some major turnarounds. They're actually going to see a, redu a reduction in their barrel of oil production by 150,000 uh, barrels of oil equivalent per day. So that's going to drop them from 600 uh, uh, by 150,000 barrels. Uh, actually, most of that's going to be at the TCO project, so it won't necessarily have as much impact on Permian. But you're going to have turnover impact. Now, you might say, well, what, what is this? Well, this happens in these industries. You can't just keep running your assets forever. Eventually, you're going to wear them out. So these turnarounds are ways that they try and improve efficiencies, repair, et cetera, so they can continue to produce in a highly effective and safe way. 
Oh, uh, another big thing, they got a $500 million payment they have to do into the pension to make up on that. That's a one-time payment, so they kind of highlighted that. Um, <clears throat> the big goals, higher operating cash flows. They're going to see more and more cash. But again, guys, this was before we were at $80 a barrel, so I think it's going to get even higher. The overarching objective, and, and what I want to give you is this. If you want to summarize in one statement, what is their goals, trends, and objectives going forward? It's this. Our objective is unchanged. Higher return, lower carbon. That is their statement. If you're selling into them, you need to be thinking about how does our products, how does our service help drive towards those two things? During this quarter, we continue to make progress towards this goal, delivering strong financial resorts and achieve important lower carbon milestones. With oil prices well above our dividend break even, what that means is uh, 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 including what their break even is, also paying out the dividend, break even of cost plus their dividend. Uh, the price is well above that. An industry-leading balance sheet, we, we will resume share buybacks, sharing part of the cash upside with our investors. So that's kind of where they're going. So the last part of this document is we wrap up the executive alignment tool is this. What questions were asked? I kind of hit some of these, so I don't necessarily spend a ton of time, but stock buyback, where's that going to come from? This $3 billion free cash flow average at 65, where are you gonna, what are you going to do with all that cash? Where else is that going to be deployed? And of course, this was before we're seeing $85 a barrel. Uh, CapEx reduction, they had a little bit of reduction in their CapEx plan, about a billion dollars. But it's not because of less investment, it's because they've been more efficient in what they're doing. And then project update, updates was a big part of the questions from analysts. Well, folks, that's the, t the first part of the tool. What do I know now? I know that cash assets, profitability are key things. I know they're in a strong financial position, which means they can invest in the future. They can build out. These new energy projects, they're in a good place to, to be a participant of that. Now you combine it with where we're at today, three months later, and, and we're gonna see a real strong performance. That's why I'm excited to see what happens on Friday. So what do I do? Where do I go next? As we jump into the analysis, the next tool is called the Navigating the Financial. Now, don't worry. You don't have to be a CFO. You don't even have to take our class to get the basics of that. Between the tool and a quick search on Google, you get it pretty clear on what they're talking about, et cetera. But this tool basically combines everything that we provide in our class. The five drivers, the key metrics and measures companies look at, and the financial statements into one place. It's a cheat sheet to help you get a quick assessment of what's going on. So on the side, you'll see the, the five drivers, cash, profit, asset, growth, and people. Here's the key metrics. Then right here is the genius. For those who have been through our program, this should look familiar to you. You don't have to memorize where all these metrics, it tells you where to go in the financial statement. If there's any sort of calculation, it's gonna give you that calculation, how to do the calculations right here. So that's the tool. What I wanna do is we're gonna practice using it. Again, we don't have time for us to go. In a normal class, if we're doing how to listen to earnings call or applying your business acumen, I would give you, okay, let's get the latest results. You're gonna go ahead and walk through and do this on your own, come back and we'll do a report out. So let's do a few and then I'll show you the rest of the numbers. Let's start with cash. Help me out, get your chat box out. Let's get comfortable using this. So here we go. I wanna get cash and cash equivalents. That's the line I'm looking for. What statement do I have to go to? It's gonna be somewhere in here, just put in my chat box. Please help us out here. Let's get a couple of us, excellent, excellent. Gotta to go to that balance sheet. Now you don't have the balance sheet. Now you could do that quick search and try and find it, but hey, I'm gonna help you out just in the interest of time. Here it is. Here's the balance sheet. Now for those that have been in my program, uh, as you look at this, this statement, it's listed by those things that are most liquid, I mean how quickly they convert to cash, down to least liquid. So where are we going to find that cash and cash equivalent? Most liquid, right at the top. Put it in the chat box. How much cash and cash equivalent does Chevron have on hand as of June 30th, the end of their quarter, uh, 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 2021? There you go. Look at I've got all those zeros. Thank you, Brooklyn. Make sure we're clear there. Absolutely. <laughs> $7,527,000,000. Now you'll notice it's an increase year over year. Now, why might? You can't just jump to conclusions, but why might they look at that? Well, we, we, we're in a pandemic, coming out of a pandemic last year, and we've seen commodity price improve. We're seeing, you know, better situation. We're deploying. You're, you're seeing that grow because of good commodity pricing. So there we go. We've got the first number. 7 billion 527 million. Let's do the next one. The next one is that cash from operations. Now remember, this one goes up or down all based upon strategy. What do we want cash from operations to do? Do you remember? There you go. We want that to go up. Absolutely. What statement are we going to go to? Put in my cash flow statement. Oh, I already told you. <laughs> Put in my chat box. What statement are we going to go to? I gave you the answer. That's cheating. My apologies. Yes, thank you, Mike. Right, Mike can listen well. 
we're going to the cash flow statement. So let's go to that cash flow statement. Now they're going to get, oh, where's my cash flow statement? This is not my cash flow statement. What happened to my cash flow statement? Okay, uh, my apologies. It looks like I've got a miss on my slide deck. So I'm just going to have to tell you, it was 11 billion. Can't see it on screen if I even showed it to you. It's over $11 billion. So let's look at that and see what that was. Here we go. $11 billion, $150 million. Now, what do you want that to do quarter over quarter, year over year? Want that to increase. Absolutely. We'll show you in a moment what that looks like. Okay, now I've done those two. Let's now get to my total revenue. I got to get my total revenue. We're going to get three, two numbers, and we're going to do a calculation. Then we'll wrap up this section. So I got to get my total revenue. I got to get my net income. Now, other names for revenue, do you remember what they were? Give me one other name for revenue. What else could it be called? Anybody remember? S sales, it can be called sales. So revenue is, can be sales and or it's a location on the statement. Give you a hint. It's not the bottom. So it, there you go, Roberto. It's the top. Absolutely. Now let's see if I messed up this one. I should have double checked my screen here. Oh, we, there's my cash flow statement. Ha! I do have them backwards. My apologies. Here's that cash flow number. There we go. So that's the number we were looking at. Of course, you see it did go up. I put them in the wrong spot. Here's the revenue numbers. Here we go. So we're doing it quarterly. I got three months. How much revenue do I have put in my chat box? Total revenue and other income. Also, we got sales here. We got some other stuff. What's our total number put in the chat box? So that's that number, but we want total revenue and other income. There you go. That's the number we're looking at. Okay. Now notice, what do we want revenue to do year over year? Increase. Look at that big increase. Put it in the chat box. Why did it increase? Because Chevron just destroyed it. I mean, they just crushed it. New innovation, et cetera. Why, why else might it have gone up? We don't have COVID as big of an impact from COVID, right? Demand changed. Uh, you know, we come out of COVID where demand was relatively low. Oil prices dropped dramatically. Now, all of a sudden, we're starting to see the whole world reignite and oil prices improving. So, uh, in the interest of the fact I messed up my slides and I have this in two different places, here's the net income number. So, remember this, $3 billion, $82 million. Now, you'll notice they had a loss last year. For those of you who are familiar with this industry, anytime you have a significant reduction of commodity price, you have to look at your assets. And if ever the value of your assets on your balance sheet are greater than the value of the market, you have to write that down. They call that an impairment. So that's why they're so low. So let me jump back here and we'll get to these numbers. Here they are. So if you take those two numbers, here's our calculation. Grab your calculator and do that for me. To get to my net profit margin, I'm going to take my net income number, which is this number, divide it by my total revenue number, which is this number. Give me that margin. What is it? For every $100 Chevron brought into the company, how much net income did they generate? Put in my chat box, if you would. Yeah, Donald's kind of representing uh, that $69 billion. That's for the uh, year-to-date number. We'll show you that in just a moment. Anybody get that calculation? For once, going twice, 8.2. Let's see if we got it. There you go. 8.2%. What does that say? For every $100 Chevron brought in revenue, in 2021, they generated $8.20 of profitability. Pretty good number for them, uh, for sure. Well, folks, that's how you use the tool. Here's the rest of it filled out. I went ahead and did that. Now you fill that out. One of the nice things to do, don't just look at one year uh, a number, look at it year over year comparison. So that's looking at Chevron Q2 2021 versus 2020. You'll notice some big numbers, net income dramatically dropped, revenue dramatically dropped. You see that in all these numbers here. Then you see these huge growth numbers. Yeah, we had a good year, but it's less about, hey, we did something different. It's purely about supply and demand, which saw, caused an increase. As, uh, who was it there? I think it was Donald kind of described, you can look at it year to date number. So here's the first six months of 2021 versus the first six months of 2020. You review it, see what's going on. Why is it happening? What's, as you can listen to your executives, see if the numbers are getting better. If the cost reduction plans are happening, you should see that in these numbers. You can also look at it from a competitor's perspective. So here we got ExxonMobil year to date versus Chevron year to date. And then finally, you may just look at it from any industry. For those that were with us last month, we talked about United Health. So you're seeing an oil and gas company versus a, a healthcare payer. And of course, the numbers are very different. But that's how you use the tool. You can capture this data however you want to. Well, folks, that is the navigating the financial tool. With that, we jump to our last part. And this last part's the most important part of the tool. It's called applying it. You got to do something with it. Here at Acumen Learning, that is our goal. Our goal is a company to help every employee understand how their company makes money, 
make decisions around the money making uh, and understand how they can impact that money making process. What we find, we have a great chance to work with many great companies, 30 of the Fortune 50. And at one point, we had a company who did a little review of what employees get from our programs. And it all is based upon applying this. Uh, here's, here's uh, what is that? Six different examples of what our customers say they get from us. 84% say they get improve, uh, they improve the performance of uh, their business or function. 81% say they increase their collaboration by understanding what their company is doing. 77% improve upward communication. 77% improve uh, employee engagement. That's a huge one. Once an employee understands the why behind what a company is doing, it changes the game for them. 75% increase business focus and 84% improve uh, uh, teamwork. Of course, our goal would be to try and do this for you and your team. But that's where this application comes in. It's absolutely vitally important you do something with it. This quote, I love it. To know and not to do is not to know. If you don't do anything with it, you've wasted that time. So what do you do with it? The last part of the tool is all about application. And here's what you do. You're going to capture your key insights. What was communicated? For me, they're extremely fi a strong financial position. Their emphasis on renewable energy is a little different than what others. They're looking at complementary opportunities where many of the others are actually going after the new energy, solar, wind, geothermal, etc. They're looking at what do I do well and how can I re use renewable energy? And of course, this big emphasis here. So the first thing is capture your insights. Take all that information, put it into usable. What, what was my takeaways? Then from there, what are you going to do with it? In my role as a consultant, I want to compare their performance. I want to see what happened in Q3. I want to then compare it against competitors as well as customers that may work with them. I then want to share those findings with my consultants, my clients, as well as new customers. How is oil and gas recovering versus consumer products versus uh, uh, aer uh, uh, aerospace, et cetera? And then, of course, we would love, we used to work with Chevron. We'd love to work with them again, the opportunity. So if you're with Chevron, you find this interesting, we want to work with you. Give us a chance to help you get a better understanding of your company. Well, folks, with that, with that in mind, the last step of this is you've got to have a conversation. If you analyze your own company, you need to sit down with your manager and share the three things you're going to do differently. If you analyze a customer or partner, think about how you can become that trusted partner with them. How does a partnership with your company really drive towards their success? If you analyze a competitor or benchmark company, it's all about how to differentiate ourselves and continue to play a big role in the industry. Folks, that is the process. So here's my... Uh, as you remember, once you complete that document, that then becomes your notes on future sessions. So completing this document helps you three months from now as you want to see the latest and greatest what's going on. So my question to you as we wrap up is this. Who are you going to analyze? My challenge, analyze a company. Is this a company you work for? A company you sell to? Compete against? Who are you going to analyze? Uh, put that in the chat box. And then with that, here's the tool. If you go to acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar, you're going to get access to that workbook. So go to that website. You get that. Our next session is going to be November 17th, and we're looking at MetLife, a, a financial services company. If you want a refresher or a review, we'll give you $100 off. It's a great program, very dynamic, social learning, helps you get a good foundation in this. And, folks, the number one thing is take this and do something with that. With that being said, it's truly been a pleasure to spend some time with you. Acumenlearning.com. Go there. If you want to talk to us, you have interest in bringing us in for your teams, we can talk you through all the different offerings we do. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day. My team will stay on. If there's any additional questions, happy to give you that. Looks like Brooklyn put in a link there. That's that quick link to get to it. Thank you, Brooklyn. As I said, our team will stay on. Let's put that in the chat box again. I'm gonna take it off the screen and open up to a full screen here. Again, acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar is where you go to access that information, give us feedback, who you think we should uh, look at in the future. I uh, get access to that discount on the online program as well as get access to the tool. Folks, it's been a pleasure. I'm not seeing any questions. Feel free to, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We'll try and answer them.
If not, just uh, leave the room once you got access to the the website. Go ahead and leave the room, and we should be good. Thank you, Roberto, for your comments. Folks, so we're hitting the top of the hour. If you, need, if you have any questions, happy to answer those. If not, go ahead and uh, just leave the room. Again, you'll get a follow-up email from us. Make sure you download the tool at acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar. Looks like uh, we just put that in the chat box there, so it should be right close to you. Was there any questions at Acumen Learning Team that were asked that we missed that we need to go back to? If so, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Well, folks, again, thank you for your time. It's been our pleasure to spend some time with you. Hopefully, you found this helpful. Please share this with your colleagues, peers, direct reports. Uh, this is our goal is to help people understand how a company makes money and how to make good decisions and the earnings calls are a great way to get clear of from alignment and execution perspective. Folks, thank you for very much for your time and ginger. Thank you for hosting and helping us get going today. I think we're ready to shut her down. <laughs>